All right, welcome to the CESS meeting. Today's date is February 16th. Our agenda has a single topic, which spilled over from last week, which is a presentation on um, the evolving consensus between uh, the CESS shim and XS's native implementation of dynamic module loading, from which I'll be presenting. Um, and it looks like that's the only topic today, so it's possibly a light meeting, depending on how quickly we get through this. Topic. Uh, are we expecting anybody from Audible here? Um, hoping, but not expecting, no. Okay. All right. Well, let's, uh, I'll share my, my slides. Theoretically. One moment. Oh, okay. That window disappeared on me. All right, presenting and sharing that screen. All right. Everyone should see a slide that says compartments excess motivated changes. Is that up for everyone? All right, cool. Um, all right, so dynamic module loading in general, um, this, is, this is the uncontroversial bit. The idea is that the compartment constructor will accept a number of additional things. It already accepts a module map. Um, and that's the, that, that's the uh, a highly overloaded mapping from uh, module, uh, full specifiers within the compartment to either uh, either a string, in which case it refers to the full specifier in the containing compartment, and uh, and thereby the static module record, not the module instance of the uh, the containing compartment, um, or, uh, or 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 possibly other things. Um, the Module map hook is a new thing that we added that I believe XS found uncontroversial and implemented as well. And that's just a fallback for the module map for things that were not anticipated at the time of construction of the compartment, um, and possibly also things that have awkward names. Um, is, it, is it an extension to the map or is it a lookup function? It's a lookup function that, that yeah. The, the lookup function is the module map hook. Yes. That's Mod what I'm about. Yeah, module map is an object. And uh, if that object is incomplete, it falls, uh, the, it, we, we check the module map hook um, for, for entries, uh, for, for static module records uh, that, that, that are presumed. That, and the module map hook is synchronous, notably. Um, whereas, uh, and, and the resolve hook is a function that's used to elevate uh, module specify like import specifiers from within an ESM module to the corresponding full specifier in the context of a particular compartment. And that's all part of keeping the coupling loose between static module records and module instances, since uh, full specifiers, um, the, the, referrer, uh, uh, the referrer module specifier for a static module record varies depending on what compartment it's instantiated in. And then, Ultimately, what the shim calls the import hook that we agree we would like to call uh, the load hook, which we've discussed at this meeting in the past. Um, yeah, so the load hook is, is the key. The load hook is what does all of the dynamic runtime module loading. This is the thing that allows us to have uh, a program that receives code at runtime from somewhere, anywhere, really. And uh, the job of the load hook is to take a full specifier locate the corresponding source, construct a static module record from the source, and, uh, and return it. And uh, that, is, uh, that, that is necessarily asynchronous. Um, that also, th th just to check, check me, that also means that the decision about what language the source is in, or, or if there even is a source text, is all encapsulated within the load hook? That's correct, yes. Um, yeah, so the load hook is is responsible for looking at the module specifier and making that decision. Um, 
and that, looking at the module specifier and inform and and per compartment. Uh, now, now, given that it's named hook, is it in fact a, a a fallback, or is it the thing that does the job if you give it one? It's a it it is a fallback. Um, and does the, it have first priority or last priority? Yeah, uh, load hook has last priority. Yeah, first priority is the module map, then the module map hook, then the load hook. Um, yeah, uh, starting so module map and module map hooking hook being for synchronous lookups for static module records, um, whereas the load hook um, can be asynchronous. Uh, and of course, all of these are memoized in two tables within the compartment, one of which is a table for static module records and the other is a table for module instances. So uh, the, the, the module map and the module map hook give you back or return a a path essentially or URL or whatever, uh, whereas the load hook actually returns the, the module itself. Uh, mod again, the module map has multiple overloads, but ultimately it's taking a full module specifier and providing the corresponding uh, static so module. A static record. module record. Yeah. This, um, so this, this seems a little weird that you have three things that kind of all do the same thing with subtle variations. Yeah, they Plus are we have the built in machinery, which also does some of the same things with subtle variations. Yeah, so part of that is motivated by access in particular, because not every um, because there's sort of tiers of usage. And in the very simplest of cases, if we go if we take excess as the excess as you case is the motivating example. Um, it does not need a dynamic module loader and until now has not had one. Um, and the base case for them is that they only had a module map. And the presumption there is that the initial compartment of the initial realm of an access program closes over and has pre-compiled all of the module, static module records that it will ever need for the life of the program. Uh, it's the working set is built into the binary. Right. When you're running out of ROM, the world is bounded. Yeah. Um, and to that end, uh, the, the, primary, the, the primary usage of a compartment in their world is um, constricting, having a compartment and then within a child compartment, constructing a new compartment that only receives static module records from the parent. And the static module record doesn't exist as a real thing for them. They refer to them by name, right? So if you had a pre-compiled binary that had a whole bunch of uh, a whole bunch of, of of static module records baked into it, pre-compiled into it, um, they aren't even necessarily linkable in the initial compartment. You can create a child compartment that gives them names in the child compartment context. Those names are the referrers for the import specifiers in those modules. Um, so you can basically take a global namespace of, of modules and then partition them into separate compartments where their, mod where their import specifiers make sense and then instantiate those compartments. But the, pri but the primary motivating use case, as I recall from their demo of um, the light bulb, uh, is that they can have um, a whole bunch of native built-in modules and some pre-compiled modules in the initial compartment um, that have full power um, to do anything with the underlying hardware. And then they can create a child compartment that attenuates those by virtualizing their implementation um, and uh, receiving powers from the parent compartment. Um, so they can present the exact same environment that they received, but with limitations like cannot cause seizures or cannot burn out the bulb um, through, through software written in JavaScript, which is compelling. Uh, that's not what we... That's not how we are using compartments at Agoric, though, um, and we haven't implemented that feature of the shim. But we do intend to support it in the standard. Um, Matthew. Yeah, I'm wondering, how does load hook being asynchronous work with the module graph? Uh, yes, modules. The module graph needs to be able to be figure it out synchronously. So how does how does that mesh? Uh, how I, I don't understand. 
I well, don't understand the question. Okay. Uh, so, let me, maybe, maybe something I can say that will clarify. A static uh, module record is um, uh, something that reflects the, a, a module source in a standalone way. It has no, to, to make a static module record from module source does not require uh, any notion of context or any consulting of other modules. So it's own, so the, the, the static link, the, the static graph uh, is a static graph that needs to be calculated well after you've reduced everything to, st to static module records. Okay. So the idea is um, you're parsing module records uh, for some identifiers you may not be able to have the static module records synchronously, but that is fine as long as ultimately you can get the whole, uh, all the module records and every identifier that are referenced. And then at that point, it's, and at that point, that's the instantiation that's synchronous. Okay. Yeah. yeah right. Exactly. You, you can't, you can't instantiate until you've got the entire transitive synchronous input. Yeah. yeah. So every loader has two. Uh, two delineated phases um, and it's basically there's an async phase and a sync phase and within the async phase you can um, you can do async fetch you can do io you can parse static module records and then with the result of parsing a static module record you can obtain information about its shallow dependencies so in the in the async phase we parse precompile um, and uh, collect the transitive dependencies of the working set for um, uh, for a particular uh, uh, initialization phase. And then once you have the entire working set loaded as a graph, then you switch and then begin the initialization phase, which involves linking and uh, linking all of the uh, creating instances of all the modules, linking them, and then initializing them in order. Um, and that is synchronous uh, <laughs> modulo top level of weight, which is, uh, <clears throat> yeah. So moving on, uh, top level of weight is not implemented by the shim. We've decided not to ever implement it in the shim, um, but excess implements top level of weight. And, uh, and the reason we're comfortable not implementing it in the shim is that we should get sufficient feedback from the implementation in excess in order to vet what we're proposing to TC39. I have two follow-up questions on this, actually. Um, what is the purpose of the module map hook? And maybe somewhat related, is the load hook allowed to mutate the module map? The load hook is, is allowed to mod uh, to Wait, no, the module map as, as, no, it does not. The module map is captured once, a snapshot of the module map is captured once up front and, it, and that object is not modified at runtime. Mm -hmm. um, the, the received object is not modified at runtime. The underlying, the, 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 the table within the compartment that maps full specifiers to static module records is modified as a side effect of the load hook. Um, and the promises that are generated by the load hook are memoized as well. So it will only attempt to load, it will only attempt to load uh, a, a module for a particular full specifier once. That, so that, is, is the module map hook just a synchronous version of load hook? Uh, with the exception of the fact that it is able to draw a static module record in from the surrounding compartment. That's the one thing it can do that a load hook can't. Um, and, and there are possibly other things because uh, as you'll note in the top bullet on the right, um, there are, we still have open questions we need to go back with XS on regarding um, redirects, meta and third party module records, which I will cover in subsequent slides. Um, but we're, we're proposing to make, to add support for those in the load hook, but not and maybe even the module map, we would like to, we might not be able to. Bradley? Yeah, so um, 
just a footnote before I forget, we need to have a discussion about web uh, stuff going on in the resolve book later. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to the resolve hook um, implications for the web. That sounds great. Uh, eager for that feedback, really. Um, so, uh, so this is what's changed. Well, or what remains, uh, it, what, what, what remains to become consistent between the shim and access for static module records. Uh, one, one difference that they did in their implementation. So the static module record constructor is like the function constructor in the sense that it receives source as an argument um, and returns an opaque object. It, well, we're proposing to DC39 that it return an opaque, opaque object that can be returned in load hooks and module maps. Um, and uh, the difference in the implementation in excess is that they made it so that it receives a record um, and then it overloads its behavior based off of what sh the shape of the record it receives between first party and third party static module records. So in our shim, the load hook can return an arbitrary object of the shape imports, exports, re-exports, and execute. And that will be interpreted as a third party module record. And if it's instant, if it's if it matches the shape of a static module record, it'll be treated as first party. Um, for reasons I I I for for reasons <laughs> that I am inferring, um, Access decided to make it so that first and third party static module records both must both go through the static module record constructor. I think their reasoning for that is that they want it to be instance of static module record and and identif and distinguishable um, from other types based off of that uh, based off of its instance of check. Um, based and, off of the instance of, or based off of a reliable branch? Uh, possibly the latter. I don't know. Um, and I think that this has implications for what you can do in a module map. The idea is that if the value in a module map is a string, it's a reference to the parent compartment static module record map. If it's an object, then there are possibilities. It could be a first party or third party static module record. Um, and, uh, we in the shim distinguish those structurally. I think that, um, they would like the ability to do so by a brand check or, or instance of check. What exactly do you mean by first and third party? Yeah. So a first party static module record is a, is a static module record that refers to ESM source. A third party static module record is how we get common JS support in or JSON or other things. Um, and third party static module records would be able, would allow you to, um, would allow you to do those things like common JS, but it, uh, we have decided so far that it is not necessary for third party static module records to participate in lazy, late lazy binding. I think I used the right word this time, lazy bindings in ESM. Live bindings? Live bindings, late, lazy, live, live, live is the right one. <laughs> it's the one I didn't think of. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. So what, what, another one to, to mention there is um, uh, WASM. Uh, WASM also does not support live bindings. Uh, and it would be a, not a requirement, but an interesting test of the generality of what we're defining here, whether WASM modules could uh, uh, simply be linked in as a third party static module records. Um, yeah. And then uh, the other difference here is that you'll note that the shape of the description of a third party module record is different in excess. And we have decided to converge on what they did for um, reasons I'll talk about. Um, so you'll note that uh, we were using a convention of having. Um, arrays and maps of imports, exports, re-exports, and an execute function. I wanted to rename execute to initialize um, in order to more closely match the uh, um, match the terminology usually used in 262 for module initialization. Um, and uh, the difference that they propose is that uh, instead of imports, exports, and re-exports, they would like us to produce, uh, to, to have the static module record represent the bindings with an array 
uh, an array of objects that's, that, that closely resemble the syntax and the order in which import declarations um, exist in the syntax of the, under, of, of the implied ESM module behind the third-party module record. Um, and uh, Matthew made the very good point that if we use this as the, the representation, we can, we can infer the imports, exports, and re-exports maps from this, but we cannot uh, do the reverse without losing information about order. And information about order is presumably important for top level await. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Is that right, Bradley? Would the order it's, matter for top level await? I no, because it links before top level await occurs. The doesn't oh. the or, but the order does matter for um, the order in which a for graph life. of modules is initialized. Right for live bindings, right? Not even for live bindings. I mean, module initialization can have side effects. So even without uh, live bindings, the order in which modules are initialized needs to be mm. de determined, determined. And my understanding is it's basically, um, you know, in the absence of cycles, um, uh, it's essentially a depth, it's a, a depth first pre-order. So it, they, they technically no, do have order, side effects, but they are contained within their module until evaluation. They are not observable. Uh, that can't possibly be true. Well, uh, that's what the spec is doing. You, when you initialize, or I think we changed it to link these days, a source text module record. I, I'm, not, will... I'm, sorry. I'm, I'm not talking about linkage. I'm talking about, I'm talking about initialization where you're running the code, the JavaScript code, uh, source code. Evaluation? Then yes, it does matter. What does initialize or execute mean, uh, Chris? In, uh, in this particular context, context, initialize is a function that corresponds to executing the body of the module from end to end, the evaluation. Okay, so, that, so in that one, this order of side effect is absolutely observable. It has yes. to be determined somehow. And I think it's a depth first post order. I, I misspoke earlier. It uh, is the depth first second. post order, except with top level of weight where siblings are initially depth first post order, but not guaranteed to complete in that order. Okay. So in order to calculate a depth first post order, you need the order of imports through each static module record. It's semantically Correct. significant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So QED. We're going to do this instead. <laughs> uh, Chris, re regarding naming, I don't think we should take 262 as precedent for naming anything. Um, uh, we should, um, uh, you know, 262 is only basically us communicating with ourselves. And we've made some really terrible, terrible terminological choices that we can justify only because we're not imposing them on anyone but ourselves. But as soon oh. as they start appearing in APIs, they need to be something that makes sense to developers. Yeah. This is why Instantiate got renamed to Link because it was publicly exposed in WebAssembly. Yeah. It was? Link? It is. Does, huh. does, WebAssembly dot module has a link method that does a thing. What does it, what thing does it do? Does it execute? Uh, WASM code there is of the WASM module? There is no execution of code. There's only initialization and allocation of variable bindings in memory. That sounds, that sounds like it could participate in live bindings. Uh, it, 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 it can but no code can execute to observe the live binding. Uh, no, they, they defined it, I believe, I'm pretty sure that they defined it in such a way that you can't have live bindings, or if you or to put it another way, if you want the effect of live bindings, you have to build it on top of what they're producing. Uh, Correct. What they're produ okay. A default WASM module cannot produce a live binding. Yeah. So what, 
should this name be <laughs> on the third party module record? Okay. Yes. What is what is sorry, evaluate? I, I I think I think instantiate is a uh, is a fine candidate because uh, we talk about module instances and this is the step that has to run to turn the the static notions into a you don't get a module instance until this step happens. So that's for one, not true, um, because um, because you of cycles. The, you uh, get so the, oh, okay. Instances are created before any module initializes. Uh, they, they exist, they, in fact, they, in, uh, instances are created before they're linked. Um, the, <laughs> all no. of the instances are created first, and then they're linked, and then they're initialized. Yeah, so uh, it, it is initialized, isn't it? Okay, In, initialize sure. is fine. So um, adding confusion here, uh, WebAssembly dot instantiate is a method, which uh, just reading a quote, uh, perform, performs both compilation and instantiation in one step. Um, so that it couples static module record construction from with with instantiation. No, it it, it no it it it. If I, I remember correctly, if, if I remember correctly, uh, the uh, the way it's specified uh, is such that an implementation can precompile things as long as it precompiles things. Uh, using a separate compilation discipline. Um, uh, or you can defer compilation to instantiation, in which case you've got the linkage graph and you can do uh, cross, cross instance comp you know, compilation and linkage decisions. Um, but the, uh, I think they should have, you know, given that they're allowing implementations to do both, I think it would have been cleaner to specify it as if separate compilation is going on, uh, but they're trying to be closer to what they want implementers to do. Uh, but in any case, their module corresponds semantically to our static module record, and their um, module instance corresponds to our module instance. So I'm just reading through specs really quick. Um... Give me a second, because there is a thing that probably gets executed at the start of instantiating a web assembly mm -hmm. module. Yeah. Um, uh, there's like a underscore start equivalent in there. Here we yeah. are. Here's, here's why I think that the non-support of live bindings is pretty fundamental, is I think that the value of the exports, the things that the module is, declares that it exports, those things don't have a value until WASM code within the module has executed. I would suggest it's a DAG, yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Uh, the start function, execute, start function, no arguments. So nothing is coming in from the externals. Nothing can be pulled in externally during instantiation. You know, start's not a bad name. And I can just link this on the chat. It has the virtue of being the Germanic uh, equivalent of initialize. <laughs> so they can do something and they can manipulate data coming in via their linkage but they can't do anything with external stuff let's come back to this 
after we have a better understanding of the signature of what I propose is called initialized, initialize, um, which I believe is soon. Yeah, here it is. So in a third party static module record, we previously in uh, what we currently have implemented in the shim is that you get um, an internal representation of the module exports namespace of that module. And this is the this is the object that can be modified from within the module that can set the exported names, the set the set the values for the exported names of the module by, as properties. Um, we also pass them the compartment and import to full specifier mappings, which the import to full specifier mapping had to be constructed during the um, the during the load phase. Uh, and there's no sense in having uh, in doing that again um, during the initialization phase. So my notion was that you'd use compartment and uh, and import now in order to emulate common JS uh, and uh, ways around that. And this this was this was clearly not right in a number for a number of reasons. And uh, the folks at Modable came back with this signature for the initialize function. Um, where it receives the module environment record. I don't know whether this is named in the spec yet, but it is a good name. Um, this is an object that represents the namespace internal to the module that the module can set values on. Um, and it enforces rules like, uh, well, uh, it, it actually doesn't enforce any rules, but it has all of the names that are imported and exported uh, in that module. So you can use this both to obtain the named values from your imports and set the named values of your exports. And they are the internal view of those names. So if there is an as uh, marker on one of the bindings, this is the this will um, this will show the correct name in from the perspective in the internal of the module, whereas the module namespace object which would, would show the exported name. Um, and uh, and then the meta. So we didn't, we didn't, we have not solved meta. We have in the proposal as written today, uh, a notion that we will add an import meta hook. And after a great deal of discussion, we have decided that that's not a good, well, that it's a, that's a fine idea, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't stand the, uh, the, the, it doesn't stand scrutiny and I'll explain in the next slide. The other, the other part about this is that in order to support top level await, the initialize function should be an async function if it has top level await and it should be a synchronous function if it does not use top level await because that information needs to be knowable. Um, that needs to be knowable before initialization begins in order to figure out the initialization order. Uh, in knowable by whom? Because from outside, you can't tell whether a function is async or not. Um, in this case, it, we will need an explicit marker either by signifying it on the prototype uh, by choosing which prototype the function inherits from either async function or function or um, or have another marker on the third party module record that expressly indicates whether it's async or not. The entity that needs to know, I forget, I forget which one it is. It's either the linker I think it's the linker. Hmm. Why why can't you call and uh, the function and see if it returns a promise or not? So, since I haven't implemented this, I'm not entirely certain. But my intuition is that we need to know whether a subgraph. We need a, so a, we. The initializer needs to know whether a subgraph is fully synchronous. Um, in order to initialize it synchronously without interleaving. Um, there should not be a possibility of interleaving events between the initialization of an entirely synchronous subgraph. And you need to know that before it's called? I think so, yeah. If it's, if it's synchronous and it returns synchronously, then it's done. I could be wrong. When it when it is not an async function, what what does it return? Uh, the initialized function returns nothing. You mean undefined? 
uh, void undefined, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, if obviously if the constraint you stated is a constraint we need, then we can't simply distinguish on that basis. Uh, but if it's not, if if that constraint doesn't turn does, doesn't turn out to be a necessary constraint, uh, that's certainly my preference is to do what Matthew suggested, uh, because then uh, we maintain the the general um, invariant or not quite invariant that uh, anything you can write that async is simply syntactic sugar for something that you can write by just manually writing a function that returns a promise. Yeah, I, I agree that that would be ideal. Um, and that'd be a good question for the modable folks because they definitely know the answer already since they have top level weight implemented already. Uh, uh, at least for nodes loader, you shouldn't need to know ahead of time. Only when you're actually evaluating the body of the module. So um, that is actually, yeah, okay. So, so dynamic import is always going to return a promise. So it doesn't really matter in the case of dynamic import whether the subgraph is synchronous or not. But uh, Modable also implements import now, which I don't think we're going to propose to TC39. I think that import now In order for import now to throw an exception, if the, the module in question can't be uh, initialized synchronously, um, that for that it needs to be, well, we need to know upfront whether the entire subgraph is synchronous. Why can't you um, throw the exception if any of the modules return a promise? Uh, that, that's just a difference in semantics. It's, uh, do we want to allow for the possibility of partially initial, partial initialization of, um, of the, of the subgraph, um, in the case where it can't be completed? Got it. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, uh, what about uh, simply a, 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 a set, just a separate flag property? That's, a, that's an option. Yeah. Okay, I think that's cleanest. I mean, it's just, it's really, really is a semantic distinction. It's a Boolean distinction and trying to infer it by sniffing at the initialized function uh, seems much too implicit. Yeah, okay. So I think we're in agreement. We are in agreement that if no indication is necessary, that is ideal. Um, if an indication is necessary, having it explicit on the third party as a property of the third party module record is an option. Um, uh, and if it's, oh, pardon, that's the last option. The, the, the next best is, can we just run it? And then if it returns a promise, then, then it's then, um, treated as async. But I think, yeah. And, and, and this, and whether we care about this for the purposes of TC39 um, versus an allowable variation of, uh, excess is another matter. Uh, I, I think that we're not certain whether we wish to propose import now. Can we go back to the module environment record? Um, does, well, it was right there. <laughs> uh, is, so is that exposed to, is that an object that's exposed to be evaluating code? The object? the module environment record the module environment record is just uh, is is analogous to the module namespace exotic object it is a different exotic object viewing the the same underlying data module. With, it's like the module namespace object in the sense that it's an object of probably an it, almost certainly an exotic object that you can read property. Uh, so um, module name spot space object is read only, if, unless I'm mistaken. Um, module yeah. environment so what I, be the writable internal version of that. What I was wondering is, can the, oh, this is only for third party uh, modules. So it's not for, um, okay, gotcha. The same thing will exist for ESM. 
but it but won't be the but it's hidden <laughs> entirely yeah it's in the shim weight lease but yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly um okay and that would be the object that is used for example for common js to move the exports okay yeah yeah so if a common js yeah common js linkage is a problem that uh uh Zubicek is working on uh for us right now so we do not have we don't we don't yet know exactly what this what what a common js initializer is going to look like but it's complicated <laughs> on account of having to both support all of the uh, most as much of the common js world as possible on top of this loader but also um also being able to accommodate the the dunder es module property um and um yeah and attempting to approach parity with the current implementation of node uh, one thing that this this will allow that node does not is um bi-directional linkage between common js and esm which is yeah. i understand a non-goal for node yeah node only allows loading common js from esm not uh esm yeah. from yeah common right. yeah for 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 node reasons that are good but but do not need to be perpetuated by our implementation um there doesn't need to be an underlying synchronous loader for our api um yeah so the other thing that we talked a lot about was meta um, we, the shim does not currently have a solution for surface or the arc and the proposal as a provisional import meta hook. But, um, my observation is that all of the information you need in order to construct the meta object for a particular module for one can't be on the static module record because it varies based off of the instance in the compartment. Um, but, uh, uh but it is awkward to construct that in a separate hook from the load hook because all of that information is a consequence of the load hook um so uh, as bradley has pointed out multiple times in the past um the web and node both um set the meta url to the response url uh that was that was obtained through fetching the record now over over http that means that you you might fetch a request url but if it follows redirects, you're going to get a response URL and you want the import meta URL to correspond to the response URL. That means that knowing what to put in meta is a side effect of loading. Um, so what, uh, what we've arrived at is that the load hook will return an envelope around the static module record in the case where it can provide meta information so static module record is an accepted return value in the simple case if and by default the meta object will be empty um, but if you return a meta module record which has which is distinguished by the presence of this meta property um, on on the object returned by load hook then we would add meta um, uh, then we would add the properties of the of the given meta object to the import meta object of the uh, of, of the module that, that would be received by initialization of that module so the meta that you see here as a second argument to initialize would be um, carried in this way from the load hook to initialization everyone with me so far because it gets weirder <laughs> in in the spec the meta object is initialized by the host right or it's created by uh it is host specific yeah T tc39 does not we, provide any opinions on the shape of meta we we do have a few opinions it must initially extend null so prototype is going to be null um in theory all objects should be sh string properties so like just string properties no symbol properties is the only hook that the spec provides, but uh, there's another hook that host can use to get out of restriction. I, I didn't know that any of those were on the TC39 side. That's interesting. Yeah. 
<sighs> There's an interesting oddity. Uh, however, most engines do not actually create the meta object until it is accessed. And since it is not available in eval, it is statically knowable if you actually ever want to create it. It's not available through direct eval? Correct. Huh. How did we do that? Well, the import keyword oh. isn't available in the script context, which is what eval is in. So import. Oh, met right, right, there. right, 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 right. The dy dynamic, it's not that the import keyword isn't available because you can do it a dynamic eval, yeah. but import meta is just is part of the module syntax. It's not expression syntax. Got it. Huh. Which means that you could have something named import that doesn't correspond. No, you can't. You can't no, because it's a keyword. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's a keyword. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I think that, that none of that comes to bear on this. Uh, the idea for us is that we would copy the properties of this onto whatever the meta instance, whenever the meta instance is created. Um, uh, unless it's really, really, really compelling in order for it to be late uh, and, and in order for the, the, the contents of the meta object to be very late, cre created at a late stage. Um, and that is probably the motivation Bradley is, is, is getting at because it is expensive to construct a meta object that, can, that contains, for example, a resolve function. And if you can avoid that work, it would be great. I am not inclined yeah. to care personally, but is that, is that, is that the case, Bradley? Uh, yes. So the web is trying, uh, node and the web are bickering a little bit about if the web should ship import meta resolve. Um, but the more, op the more properties you put on this thing, the more expensive it is. So, because these are still going to be no prototypes. So mm -hmm. you're going to have a closure generally associated with any uh, function you put on it. Mm -hmm. So this being early days, uh, I suggest that we should um, go ahead and uh, uh, not initialize it lazily, uh, create it eagerly up front, um, because uh, that will be a disincentive to piling lots of stuff on it. Yeah. Huh. What we could do, what we could do is later add an import meta hook that elaborates or embellishes the meta object based off of the data that's on it already. That would probably be sufficient to, uh, that would probably be sufficient to address the question of la lazily creating a closure object on every module. Make it exotic so that it triggers traps or what, what would be? Well, so there would be a meta object. We would, con we would, con we construct a meta object for every module regardless. Um, the, the meta that's returned by the load hook um, could do, could, could, could add a resolve function to the meta object, um, but doesn't have to. Um, it could be deferred. In the cases where there's a performance concern, we could add an import meta hook that receive that only receives the existing meta object and can embellish it with a resolve function of, of resolve closure. And we would only call the import meta hook if uh, if the meta is ever accessed by client code. That seems fine. Because I would have... go ahead. I'd assume whatever you're storing inside this record is what is needed to form those closures. Yeah, I think that, that and I think that's the right way to go about it. I mean, it would be incredibly awkward to do it any other way. <laughs> it just involves having a side table for per compartment with uh, the information that was discovered during the load phase so that it can be used in the creation of an import meta hook later, uh, which okay. is an option. It's just awkward. So yeah, so it's not that there's an exotic meta object that 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 ends up calling the hook on access. It's that import.meta itself, that, that syntax is a special form. And it's the use of that syntax 
uh, the first time that causes the hook to be invoked. Um, yeah. And then once there's a meta object, it can just be a plain object that satisfies these constraints. Right. And the import, right. Um, you, though I don't think that you can actually capture the import meta object, can you? I've never tried. I think you could only get properties off of it. No, no, import, oh, no, import dot meta is a regular import. object. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, it okay. Is, it is used as a cache key in several frameworks. Well, yeah, import dot meta is an expression with a value. Got it. All right. So, um, but yeah, with some constraints on what it can be. Yeah. Okay. So we can't return an arbitrary thing in this meta thing. It really has to be a bag of properties that get copied onto an object that has a null prototype. Um, so anyhow, so that's this topic. <clears throat> this, but I will note that the metadata is not involved in um, in module resolution. Like we don't use URLs. Well, the web does, but mm, it's weird. Uh, <laughs> well, the, the, so the meta object does not participate in module resolution mass within the compartment, um, which means that we need to have a separate envelope for redirect, um, which is analogous, but not the same as, um, uh, uh, well, in any case, the redirect, uh, th th this is the case where if you were to um, if you were to load dot, for example, in a in a node style package, that corresponds to in like source slash index.js after you've looked at the aliases that are in the uh, in the pa package JSON. Um, in that case, I discovered quite accidentally, for lack of forethought, um, that the module refer specifier of that module needs to be source slash index, not dot. Otherwise it's import specifiers are not resolvable. Um, so what this, what the redirect module record, which we have implemented in the shim, although we have not implemented meta, uh, allows us to, uh, to express, hey, you, uh, you attempted to load dot, you actually got dot slash index JS, here is the corresponding meta or static module record for for that module and that's what this feature is is that clear clear as mud i'm sure i we're getting into the relative resolution of identifiers here uh and where identify, identifiers are supposed to be opaque strings but they really are not and that's i right. still have a hard time around that yeah because the spec pretends they're opaque and no, the, the the spec leaves it to the host to interpret them. It doesn't. It doesn't. There's there's nothing in the spec that implies that the host doesn't look at the internals of one of those strings. Right. So what I mean is that if we provide a module map, um, if user code provides a module map when creating compartments, um, there are questions about what the identifiers used there should be. Uh, yes. So, so the, the, from the perspective of what we're proposing to TC39 is that that will continue to be a host decision and we're providing host hooks so that anyone who can construct a compartment can make those decisions. Um, and so it is important that this, um, that the specification for compartments be flexible enough to handle um, uh, to, to handle the access use cases, the web use cases, the node use cases, and hopefully use cases we have yet to dream. Um, so uh, throwing some wrenches, uh, the redirect string. Um, is that absolute? Is it meant to be a cache key? It is meant to be a full specifier. And I okay. distinguish that from an absolute specifier because absolute means different things depending on context. Um, uh, so a full specifier, sure. Full specifier uh, is a cache key. No. Thanks to import assertions, we have, we have, learned that painfully in node. 
It is, it is no longer just a string. Um, told you so. No, no, I know. We are no, complained at TC39. <laughs> yeah. It, it, import assertions have landed? Yes. Okay. So um, it participates in cache keys. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> it will have to just part you know in order to get import assertions implemented it will have to participate in the cache key yeah and we're at time as alex points out and which is good because this is my last slide um that uh thank you everyone that turned out to be a much fuller topic than i expected and i'll be sure to share this with our friends at modable i'm going to stop recording I still want to see how this whole meshes up with uh, module fragments and uh, module blocks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I think that the questions that we're answering here regarding redirects and meta and those things um, need analogous answers when it comes to module fragments and blocks. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, my hypothesis about module blocks is our static module record is exactly a module block. Yeah, and I think that what I'm what we're seeing here is that that hypothesis will need to be revised. That a module, a module block needs to. Oh, yes, yes, you're right. Which is to say that if you were to return a module block in a load hook, it would need to potentially be enveloped for, with a redirect or a meta, um, and and I think that that's consistent with what we've got here. Good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Running. Thank you, everyone.